All right, let's get all of our stuff warmed up here and let you know that I am pleased to have you join me in the study of God's Word. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, we are told to study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen who do not need to be ashamed, but we are able to rightly divide the Word of Truth. And in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, as we see up here, is a perfect example of that, and that is the Bereans. The Bereans were more noble-minded in the fact that they questioned the things that were being presented to them, and they searched the Scriptures daily to find out if those things were correct or not. You have the right, you have the responsibility that anything that is spoken here, specifically behind the pulpit within the next little bit, um, you can question me on those things. Um, they questioned the apostles. Well, you know, where are you getting these things from? So the apostles would uh, turn to the scriptures and say, this is where we got these things from. So uh, hopefully as we study, you'll uh, see yourself in the same light as, as the Bereans. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, we are told, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and it will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We studied a little bit this morning about God's love in, in our uh, study of Revelation. This morning also, I think these will kind of go compatible with each other because they run uh, alongside of each other. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, according to God's great mercy. And we're going to talk about His mercy, and I don't want to look at it again uh, as the world views uh, many things, and that is a very one-dimensional view. However, there are a lot of things that the Bible speaks of God's mercy. According to His great mercy, we see that regarding mercy, we know that God is a God of mercy. If you will, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, and it's 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. Blessed be, the God and <clears throat> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which he ourselves, which we ourselves are comforted by God. So he understands that we need comfort, that this is a very tough thing that we have to do to live on this life. And the reason that he knows that is because his son came down here to live just as we live, to be tempted in every single aspect that we uh, are, are tempted in. And yet he rose victorious, so he understands the struggle that each and every one of us have. And us, as we kind of live through life and we gain experience through life of the pain of life, we also understand that we need to show comfort to others as well. That's how God perpetuates his mercy. He continues to show his mercy towards us during those tough times, and then we do the same for each other. So we start to mold ourselves and our character to be just as God is. We also see something else about this God of mercy, and that is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, notice the language here, talking about past tense. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, <clears throat> and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, and because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trans transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing, surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. What a great God that we serve to show us such mercy. All of these things we formerly used to walk in. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We formerly walked according to the course of the world. 
according to the prince of the power of the air, the prince that is now working in the sons of disobedience. We were in all of that. There are sons of disobedience, and the spirit that is now working in them is from the, <clears throat> according to the prince of the power of the air. Notice this, among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts. But a change has happened. And God's mercy stepped in. And it gave us a path in which we could live our lives. Turn away from these things. And Him being rich in His great mercy and His love towards us, He gave us Christ. We have been saved by grace because of that. He goes on to say, we've been raised up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in order Christ Jesus in order that the ages to come, that is us, He might show the surpassing riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. In all the ages to come, after we are gone, that great mercy will still be shown. We also see that He's a God of mercy by the psalmist. In Psalm chapter 57, verses 9 through 11, it says this of God. I will give thanks to Thee, O God, O Lord, among the peoples I will sing to Thee among the nations, for Thy mercy is great. It is great to the heavens and Thy truth to the clouds. Be exalted above the clouds, O God. Let Thy glory be above all the earth. So the psalmist understood the great mercy, and he probably understood it from standing from a standpoint of experience of where he once was and where he is now in his relationship to God. And whenever he was caught in his sins, God did not have to show mercy, but he did. And he showed mercy so that we would start to follow him. So we see a couple of things, and that is regarding mercy, we know that God is a God of mercy. There is absolutely no denying that. We also see that man is saved by God's mercy. We read uh, one uh, shortly ago, but let's read a few others. And that is in Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. For we also once were foolish ourselves. Notice the past tense again. Disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. Spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now notice what he says here, and read this in context of what it says about mercy. First of all, we do see that he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. That's where he saved us. We were once lost in our sins, and we were dead in our sins, and we are no longer. And it has absolutely nothing to do with what we do in righteousness, but it is because of his mercy. Now what we see here also we also once were foolish ourselves. Something has changed in us. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 16, it says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly, notice the past tense again, I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor, a violent aggressor, and yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. And yet for this reason, I found mercy in order that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. A few things we see about Paul in his statement here. He says, I am the foremost of all sinners, and for that very reason I found mercy, so that Jesus Christ could show that the foremost of sinners 
can find mercy. We see that all these things that he used to be, a change has happened. The grace of our Lord was more than abundant for even the sins that Paul had. And so we see that God has a very saving mercy for us. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10, we see this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We were scattered sheep. We were not a nation, not a people. But God brings us together and He makes out of these scattered and lost sheep a nation. A chosen race. He makes them a priesthood. A holy nation and it says a people for God's own possession. Now notice that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you. We have a mission, we have a purpose, we have a reason. He has given us all things that we need. He has extended mercy to each and every one of us. Even though we were lost, even though we were sinners, you can consider yourself the foremost of sinners, that's already been covered. But God brings about His saving mercy, and look what happens whenever He introduces that into the system. And that is, we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy, and now we are a nation. So we see a few things again to recap. <clears throat> Regarding mercy, we note that God is a God of mercy, that man is saved by God's mercy. But we also note this, that mercy is to be sought. It's not just laying out there, and then we don't have to do anything, and we just kind of get swallowed up in it. There's a lot of error on this subject being taught in the religious world today about the subject of mercy. So let's look at a few things. In Psalm chapter 40, verses 16 through 17, the psalmist says this, Let all who seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let those who love thy salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. Since I am afflicted and needy, let the Lord be mindful of me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. So as we look at this, we see a few things about mercy and about God. Let all who seek thee rejoice. Let all thee who seek thee be glad. All these who seek thee and who love thy salvation. Do you realize there are people who do not love the mercy of God? They do not love the salvation that is offered to them. And so as we respond to this and we seek this, we are the ones who need to rejoice and be glad about the mercy that has been uh, given to us. I may be afflicted. I may be needy. But let the Lord be mindful of me. He is my help. He is my deliverer, and He will not delay. In Matthew chapter 15, beautiful story, Matthew chapter 15, and this illustrates our point that we're trying to make about seeking mercy and what it kind of takes to do that. So in Matthew chapter 15, verse uh, 22, and behold, a Canaanite woman came out of that region and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came to him and kept saying to him, saying, Send her away, for she is shouting out after us. She's causing a disruption. She's become a nuisance. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
Now notice her response. She's got her answer. Sorry. But she came and she began to bow down before him. He said, Lord, help me. And he said and answered, it's not good to take the children's bread. My, my mission to give bread to the house of Israel, it is not good for me to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Another answer. Notice her reply back. Because this is a woman who is seeking mercy. But she said, yes, Lord. But even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. I am not asking for your very best miracle. I am asking for a crumb of what I know you are capable of doing. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O oh woman, your faith is great. Be it done for you as you wish. And her daughter was, daughter was healed at once. Now this is a woman who was seeking mercy. Seeking it with every fiber of her being. She knew from where that mercy would come and she went to that source. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 through 16, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have a high priest who has been tempted in all the things as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. You know, a lot of times we think that we come to God's uh, throne and we need to be very scared about it. And Notice what this says. We have a high priest. He sympathizes with us. He understands our nature. He knows the trials and tribulations that we go through because he was tempted in every single way that we were. And because we have that high priest, let us therefore, because of that, let us draw near with what? Confidence to the throne of grace. Let us draw near with confidence that we may receive mercy, that we may find grace to help in time of need. Are you in a time of need of your life right now? You can come with confidence to the throne of grace. And it is because we have a high priest that he understands our weaknesses, and yet he is still without sin. So we see that seeking mercy is something that we must do. We also see regarding mercy, we need to know that mercy does not annul obedience. And many people believe that it, that it does. That because there's mercy sitting out there, I am no longer obligated to do anything. Let's take a couple of look at a couple of scriptures on this subject. First Peter chapter one verses twenty two through twenty five. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again not of seed which is perishable but imperishable. That is through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and his glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord abides forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. And so as we look at this we see since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls. Now we were just talking about mercy and how it purifies the soul and how it is a saving grace. And now we see that this obedience to the truth is what purifies the soul. From a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. And then it goes on to talk about where they actually came from. And remember we talked earlier about he gave us um, the opportunity to be born again. He says you have been born again, not of seed which is corruptible or perishable, Something that is man, and you notice what he says here, this, this stuff that is perishable, all flesh is like grass and it's glory like the flower of grass. All these self-help books and everything else that's out there. It will wither, 
It will go away. It is of man. But we pre purify our souls through is this seed that is through the living and abiding Word of God. It is imperishable. It does not die. It does not go away. As much as people reject it, as much as people try to hide it, as much as people try to silence it, it marches forth in time just as strong as it was back in the day when Moses started the, the, the writings. And we see here also the word of the Lord abides forever and this is the word that was preached to you. And that's why it's important that we know what's being preached to us and that words that we find in there and that we're not deceived. If we are deceived and you're following the wrong thing, where's the salvation now? We still must obey. According to uh, in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 through 9, and we were just talking about Hebrews just a second ago, weren't we? And how we have that high priest and how we can kind of come, uh, come confidently to the throne of grace. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 through 9 says, Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. A few things to note. Where does obedience come from? We already studied, we just uh, read just a second ago that obedience comes from obeying the Word of God. We see here that although He was a son, He learned obedience from the things which He suffered. We will go through suffering. And that is where we learn obedience. And we call in times of need and in times of help. We go boldly to the throne of grace. We also see, and having been made perfect or um, uh, pure, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. So in his name, we will be suffering, and that is where we learn our obedience. It's where we are tried and purified through those trials and tribulations that we go through. We also see something else, and that is Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Now let's stop right there. Grace has appeared and it has brought salvation to all men. Next verse, instructing, instructing us. The grace of God instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself a people for His own possession, zealous for good works. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Boy, there's a lot stated in there. And the subject is about grace. It instructs us that we have a life to live unto God. And that we must turn away from all of this other stuff. Ungodliness. Worldly desires. We are to live sensibly. We are to live righteously. We are to live in, uh, godly in the present age. Whatever age you're in. You still have to live godly. That grace has come upon us. It has been offered to all mankind. And it is teaching us that we must live in this way. It also states uh, here at the very end, uh, towards the end here, that we are to be zealous for good deeds. Remember we were talking about seeking mercy? We have to seek and be zealous for good deeds also. I can speak these things and I can speak them and exhort and I can reprove with all authority because 
That's what grace is. In Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 18. Now here's a question. Shall we sin because we are not under law, but we are under grace? May it never be. God will not allow that. That is not what His mercy and grace is. His mercy and His grace is out there so that people will follow Him. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? You will fall on one side of the fence either of sin, which results in death, or of obedience, resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. If I could sum up Romans, this would be it. You know how James teaches that faith without works is dead? What Romans teaches, works without faith is dead. You have to have them both. You can't just go along thinking, I'm just going to do this and I got my little check mark. What it says is you became obedient from the heart. There was a change on the inside, not just the outside. And the whole book relates to that. You must be obedient from the heart to God. Because God will not let you, allow you to live in such a way that you can continue in sin because grace is out there. And so we see that regarding mercy, we know that God is a God of mercy. He is, uh, man is saved by God's mercy. Mercy is to be sought. Mercy does not annul obedience. And lastly, we know that mercy will not always be available. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, I know many of you probably thought, I know where he's going with this. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? It will end. There will be no more opportunity to seek that mercy. And we see also, <clears throat> the Lord is not slow about His promise. Some do count this as slow. It's, it's taken you know, 2,000 years now. He is patient. That's what we ought to look at. It ain't that He's slow. He's patient. And the reason that He's patient is because He wishes that all to come to repentance. Not just the few, but all. So if His desire is that all come to repentance, then we also ought to understand that that grace extends to all also. But some will not come to repentance. And when that day comes, it will be too late. Too late to do anything about your relationship to God. I don't see anywhere in here where it says that it's going to happen August 1st, 2021. Or tomorrow, or the day after. It doesn't give us a date. I just know that it will happen. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10, for after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well, when the Lord shall come and shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God, and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction. 
away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. When He comes to be glorified in His saints on that day and will be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed. Notice a few things here. And that is, there will be judgment coming and the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels and flaming fire. We read that earlier in Revelation. We also see dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel. Now, if you look at that in the Greek, it is the perfect tense. And what that means is, who have not started obeying and who currently is not obeying. And that is, there will be people who fall away. And if they are not currently obeying the gospel of, of God, they fall into this group also. We also see, and these will pay the penalty of eternal, but when he comes to be glorified the saints on that day, he marveled at among all who have believed. So when we take a look at this mercy, there is an end to it. And our last one I want to look at, our last scripture I want to look at on this mercy's end, is 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome to those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, let all those who suffer according to the will of God entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. This is the same tense that we talked about earlier. Those who do not obey the gospel of God, it is a perfect tense, and that means who are not currently obeying. And if that's true, and it even says in the very next verse, and if you read it in that context, if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome of those who are not currently obeying the gospel of God? And if it's with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what's going to be the hope for the godless man and the sinner? And so as we read this, we do understand that mercy does have an end. It may be tomorrow, it may be today, maybe now, maybe on your drive to back home. Regarding all of this and the mercy, God is a God of mercy. Man is saved by God's mercy. Mercy is to be sought. Mercy does not annul obedience. Mercy will not always be available. With all of this in view, we must not view God's mercy in a like manner. It is not something that we ought to just look at flippantly. That I can live my life any way that I wish. We are seeing the results of that teaching come to us now in the world. You don't have to live a godly life. You don't have to obey God. We see all the destruction that is happening around us and the chaos that is happening and the fear that is starting to strike many people. But it's because they look at God's mercy in a very light manner. If I die, I die, that's fine. It is time to respond to His will. If you will go ahead and take out your song books and open up the song of invitation, which is 835. With God's mercy, we seek, we obey, we receive. It's out there. We are told that we must believe. In Mark chapter 16, verse 16, He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. That is a very easy, easy statement. It's a simple statement. Sometimes it's hard to do. The evidence is in front of us. Everything that God says will happen whenever a nation is caught in sin, we see happening today, and yet still, people do not respond. It's time for us to seek, to obey, to receive by believing.
We also told that we need to repent. We noticed that we noted that numerous times, and I wanted to note how many times I said, "Look at the past tense." You're talking about God's mercy. We once were this. We once were that. That's what we're talking about. To turn away from. And Peter said to them, Repent and let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You must turn away from the life that you once lived. We also see that we are told to confess. In Acts chapter 8, verses 37 through 38, perfect example of that. And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. So we see that you are to confess, and that's exactly what the eunuch did. He confessed, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We also see that one is to be baptized. In our previous uh, verses we just looked at, we saw baptism mentioned in those. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 21, it says, And corresponding to that, and that is Noah being saved by water, if you read back up, just as Noah was saved by water, baptism now saved you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Notice how all of that works together. Baptism saves us. It is not a bath that we take. It's not for the removal of the dirt of the flesh. It is an appeal to God. It brings us a good conscience. And it is only through the resurrection of Jesus Christ that that baptism accounts for anything. We also see we are to live faithfully. And I hope that in looking at God's mercy that all of us can kind of see ourselves in this somewhere. Maybe this is where you are. You've done the believing, the repenting, confessing, the baptizing. Or you've been baptized and now we're talking about living faithfully. Romans chapter 11 and verse 22 says, Behold then the kindness and severity of God. To those who fail, severity. But to you, God's kindness. If you continue in His kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. So as we look back, I'll leave you with this last verse to kind of think about. And hope that you can kind of make this your declaration as well. In Psalm chapter 86, verses 11 through 13, it says, Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. And I will glorify your name forever. For your mercy towards me is great. And you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. If you find yourself needing to respond to anything that we've talked about, please do so. Do not put this mercy off.